This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on concurrency bugs and race conditions. Concurrency bugs, often called race conditions, involve multiple threads of control competing for some shared resource on your system. Most commonly, the result of a race condition is a computation value that depends upon the timing of multiple threads of control running. Usually, these types of bugs are infrequent and difficult to find because they happen only very rarely when particular timing things line up, and it's usually something you don't see in testing. But it will happen to you in the field if you have that kind of bug in your software. One type of race condition is caused by concurrent access to a shared variable. Solving this requires locking shared resources, and we'll discuss this. Another type of concurrency bug comes from not accounting for the effects of multitasking on the performance of your system. Task switching and interrupts cause delays, but they can be worse than just a minor interruption. If you have a prioritized tasking system, timing problems can cause starvation and priority inversion, which can cause your system to entirely fail. The anti-patterns for race conditions are first, you have unprotected access to shared variables. And as we'll see, that's solved by using locks on shared variables. Another anti-pattern is that your shared variables are not declared volatile. So even though you said you were going to write the variable, the compiler optimized away the write or delayed the write. Another anti-pattern is not accounting for interrupts and task switching when you do your timing analysis, and in particular, when you have a prioritized scheduling system. The last anti-pattern is more about what happens during testing. If you're ignoring non-reproducible faults, probably what's going on is you have race conditions or other concurrency bugs, and you're just ignoring the fact they're there because you couldn't reproduce it. A classic case of problems with race conditions was the Therac 25 back in the 1980s. This is a software-controlled radiation therapy machine, and so radiation was used to treat cancer and there were a number of patient overdoses that resulted in some fatalities. The story is long and complicated and well worth read for anyone who does software safety. But the relevant problems for race conditions included that if the operators typed on the keyboard a little bit too fast during a particular eight second window, they would get an incorrect dosage. A completely different race condition was that the system bypassed safety checks when a counter rolled over and so every once in a while, when the counter happened to roll over to zero and then started counting with positive integers again, during the time that counter was zero, the safety checks would be bypassed. Both of these are concurrency bugs or race conditions that ultimately resulted in fatalities. Let's start our tour of concurrency management bugs by considering a single CPU system with a shared resource. If you have a CPU that switches among its tasks, so it's multi-threaded or multitasking, Ask the question, what happens if the task switching happens at the wrong time? The result can be concurrency bugs due to shared resources. Let's look at an example. Here we have a timeline, time going from top to bottom. We have two tasks, task one and task two, and there's a shared global variable that currently has the value five. Let's assume that task one reads that value and then it gets a read and it decides to add one. So now task one thinks the value is six, but the global variable is still five because it hasn't written it back yet. Now here's the problem. What if there's a task switch after the time task one reads the global, but before it has a chance to write it back? Task two then takes over and it reads the global, which is still five, and it wants to add three or do some other computation. Task two will complete its computation. It'll add three, it'll write back the result of eight, and the global variable will be eight. As far as task two knows, the value is eight and it's done its job. But eventually the task is gonna switch back over to task one and it still has the five plus one and so it writes back its value six. If these two tasks run at different times, the global variable would be five plus one plus three, it should give you nine. But what happens here is because task two got overwritten by the interrupted task one, the value six. So you get an incorrect value on the global variable, but it only happens when this particular interleaving occurs when task one and task two are trying to access the global at the same time. That means that the results of the concurrency bug depend upon the ordering. Concurrency bugs that involve a race condition to a shared resource can be solved by using a mutex, where mutex stands for mutual exclusion. 
The easy solution is you disable interrupts when touching a shared variable. It inhibits task switches, but you need to keep this very brief in order to avoid timing problems. If you need to hold a shared resource, such as a global variable, for more than a handful of clock cycles, you can use something heavier weight called a mutex, which is a mutual exclusion flag. It's a flag that when the flag is true, the resource is busy, and when it's false, the resource is available. So to use this, this means that each global variable or other shared resource, it might be an ADD converter, it could be a hardware resource too, has with it a flag. So that's right, you have to have the global and you have to have another variable that's a flag. And the flag tells you whether or not it's safe to access the global, depending on whether some other task is using it. So to solve the problem we saw on the previous slide, to access this shared resource in a safe way, you first get the mutex. So here, there's global variable five, task one gets the mutex, and the mutex happens to be free, so it gets back an OK. In other words, the mutex is false. And by the way, when it does that, as part of it, it sets it to true, so everyone else knows that the mutex is, is true and the global variable is taken. It does the read, and it adds one. So task one is at six, same as before. But when a task switch occurs, task two goes out and says, hey, I want to access the variable. Let me get the mutex. But because task one has set the mutex to busy, task two says busy and says, oh, OK, someone else has it. It relinquishes control. The task switches back to task one. Task one completes the write, putting the correct value of six. And later on, the next time task two tries to get a task slice, it'll say, get mutex. Oh, the mutex is free, and it'll be OK. Of course, that only happens if task one releases the mutex, which sets it to false when it's done. Be sure to remember that mutexes themselves are also a special type of shared variable. So you have to use great care in making sure you build the system. Going back up to the top of the slide where I said you could disable interrupts, really the trade-off looks like this. If you have a shared variable and all you're gonna do is add one and put it back, you might just as well disable interrupts, add the one, write it back, re-enable interrupts. But if you're doing something complicated, like you have a large data structure and you don't wanna hang the processor up with the interrupts disabled for too long, you instead use the disable interrupts to set the mutex, re-enable interrupts, and now that the mutex is set, you can do whatever you want because you have exclusive use of the resource. And then when you're done with the resource, you release it by releasing the mutex, just setting it back to false, and now some other task can use it. Whether you're using disabled interrupts or mutex, you're solving concurrency problems by locking shared resources to avoid race condition. That's great, but it brings with it some potential problems that you have to deal with. The general concept for the types of problems you see is blocking time. Blocking time is the period of time in which the CPU has locked up either by disabling interrupts or using a mutex that prevents other tasks from running because they're waiting for that shared resource. The simplest heuristic here is to minimize the time interrupts are disabled. And if you're not using mutexes, that's all you need to do. The issue is that the reason disabling interrupts works is it turns off the task switcher. And if you can't switch tasks, then you don't have a concurrency problem. But the time when the task switcher is disabled is blocking time because if you have a higher priority interrupt or higher priority task, it has to wait till you're done, even if you're a very low priority task that's disabled interrupts. And you might say, well, mutex is re-enable interrupts right away. Well, yes, but there's a problem. And the problem is that the higher priority tasks that might want that same variable are going to see the mutex is taken and they're going to have to wait for the mutex to be released. So it's just like waiting for interrupts to be re-enabled, except it only affects the other tasks sharing the particular shared variable. The result in either case is priority inversion. Priority inversion is when a low priority task blocks high priority tasks by tying up the CPU or tying up a shared resource. So here's an example. In this case, time goes from left to right. We have a high priority task and a low priority task. And the low priority task is in the blue doing normal execution. In the orange, it's gotten hold of a mutex and set the mutex to true. And we call that entering a critical section when it has a critical shared resource. If the high priority task needs the mutex, it can start execution because it has high priority, but it'll sit there and say, oh, the mutex is taken and it won't be able to make progress. On a well-designed system, the high priority task will release the CPU to give the low priority task a chance to complete. The low priority task will finish its work with the mutex. It'll release the mutex. And then the high priority task will be able to run. And as soon as it runs, it gets the mutex because that's what it was waiting for. This is called bounded priority inversion. 
as long as you can guarantee the maximum length at which the low priority task needs the mutex, you know the high priority task will never be delayed more than that. But notice, even here, it is priority inversion because the high priority task has to wait for something with lower priority to complete. This particular type of priority inversion only involves tasks that actually use the mutex, not all tasks. So there might be a medium priority task or an even higher priority task, and as long as they don't touch the mutex, they're going to run just fine with their established priority. But there's a critical problem, and this picture is overly simplistic because it emits a special case that can cause the high priority task to have unbounded priority inversion, and we'll get to that on the next slide. The problem with the previous picture is that it missed an important special case that has actually been a problem on real systems. If you have not two tasks, but three tasks, you can get unbounded priority inversion. That means that the high priority task might have to wait an extremely long time to get its chance to complete because the low priority task has the mutex. Here's how the mechanism works. Let's say you have a medium priority task. So before we had high and low, medium is in between them. And this medium task is completely uninvolved in the mutex. It doesn't even know the mutex exists. So let's look at a timeline. As before, the low priority task is executing because the high priority task has nothing to do. It grabs hold of a mutex. At that point, the high priority task decides it needs to run and it needs the mutex. It fails to get the mutex because the low priority task has it. And it says, fine, I'm going to relinquish control and the low priority task can start computing again. But before the low priority task gets done, a medium priority task comes along. Now here's the catch. The high priority task has relinquished control until the mutex is released, so it's out of the running. It's just sitting and waiting. The low priority task is running along with the mutex, but the medium priority task is higher than the low, so the medium task grabs control and runs as long as it wants to. Now, the low priority task didn't have a mutex. This would be fine, because medium priority is higher priority. It's supposed to run first. But that medium task could have a really long blocking time. It could just run for a very long time. And the low priority task holds the mutex that whole time until the medium's done. Only then does the high priority task get to run and have the mutex because it's been waiting on the mutex too. So you have unbounded priority inversion involving this medium priority task that had no idea this was going on and never touches the mutex. The problem here is that a medium priority task has stalled the high priority task indirectly and trying to account for all the possible medium priority tasks is really tough and basically gives you, in most systems, an unbounded priority inversion that's just way too long. To handle this case, you need some sort of plan to avoid that medium priority task delaying the low priority task. Unbounded priority inversion can be solved by using a technique known as priority inheritance. Priority inheritance works by taking the low priority task that had the mutex and elevating its priority while it has hold of the mutex, and then restoring back to low priority when it frees the mutex. Here's a picture to explain it. The setup is the same. We have a low priority task that grabs a mutex. We have a high priority task that wants the mutex but fails to get it because the low already has it. In priority inheritance, what happens is as the high priority task fails to get the mutex, as a side effect, it hoists the priority of the low priority task. So basically, the low priority task is inheriting the priority of the high priority task that wants the mutex. It doesn't get hoisted all the way to the highest priority in the system. It just needs to be the same or the same plus one of the high priority task. That means that tasks even higher than the high priority task still get to run. They aren't delayed. But all the tasks below the high priority task have to wait for this mutex to be released, including that pesky medium priority task. The medium priority task wants to run as before, but it's delayed because the low priority task is running the entire time until it releases the mutex. Eventually, the low priority task is done with the mutex and immediately stops running. It gets reverted back down to its normal priority, and the high priority task can now grab the mutex it was waiting for and run. And it keeps running even after it releases the mutex because it is higher than the medium priority task. Eventually, when the high priority task is done, the medium priority task gets to run, and then we go back to the low priority task when both of those are done. So again, what's happened here is that when the mutex is grabbed by a low priority task, nothing happens yet. When some higher priority task wants the mutex and is waiting for it, rather than just giving up and waiting, the operating system grabs the low priority task, moves it up to the same priority as the high priority task, to get that mutex released as fast as possible, consistent with that priority. 
And then as soon as the mutex is released, the low priority task goes back to normal and the high priority task can run. And this basically guarantees that the blocking time caused by priority inversion is limited only to the runtime of the low priority task and no intervening task can cause that unbounded problem we saw in the previous slide. While unbounded priority inversion and the need for priority inheritance might sound very esoteric, this actually causes problems in the real world. A classic example is the Mars Pathfinder incident. The Mars Pathfinder was a rover that launched July 4th, 1997, and was sent to Mars. It was notable that it had been decades since the US had gotten onto the surface of Mars. So this is a big deal that this rover landed and started running around. But there was a problem. After the lander took some great pictures and you can see the rover there up against a rock, they had rover failures. Multiple system resets occurred via the VxWorks operating system. Now the good news is the watchdog timer was set properly and it saved the day and it reset the system to a safe state. The bad news is that because of the time delay with Mars and the way the mission was run, every time you get a system reset, you would lose hours and hours of mission time. You only get so many days on Mars due to the dust buildup on the solar cell. So every time the system reset, this was a huge problem. It lost a significant chunk of the mission. The team was eventually able to reproduce the problem on the ground. They uploaded a patch and then the mission was successful after that. But the root cause for those resets was in fact pretty much exactly what we saw on the preceding slide. It was unbounded to priority inversion due to a medium priority task delaying things, causing the watchdog timer to trip. How did that happen? Well, the developers did not turn on priority inheritance. The operating system had it, but they turned it off because they were worried about processor performance and execution speed. The explanation was the data bus task executes very frequently and is time critical, so we shouldn't spend the extra time in it to perform priority inheritance. But skipping that step almost cost them the mission. The moral of the story is you have to turn on priority inheritance if you have mutexes that can result in unbounded priority inversion. And if it's too expensive, you need to rethink your system and re-architect your system so you don't need the mutex anymore. This tutorial has explained the basics of race conditions and concurrency bugs, but they appear in many, many different variations and different combinations. So it's important when you're designing a system to ask some questions about task interactions. One question is, what if a task switches at a bad time? We saw an example that would result in an incorrect value. Another one is, what if two tasks read the same piece of data at different times? If that data has changed out from under them, it might be that two tasks have different notions of what the data value could be because they read it at different times. And that can result in problems. What if a half-formed data structure is read? For example, what if a timer tick is updating time of day and it interrupts some other value that reads, for example, the hours, the time of day tick interrupts it and updates the time, and then the main task reads the minutes. You could get malformed results if the minutes went from 59 to zero, but it had already read the hours in the main task. What if multiple writers are competing for data? And again, we saw an example of that, but that's a more general problem. Generally speaking, what you should be doing is using the RTOS services to help. Disable interrupts for shared variables if that's sufficient. Use mutexes if disabling interrupts doesn't work. And also ask yourself, what happens if different tasks need the same data? Are they reading it in a coherent way to all get the same value? Or is it possible the value is being updated and they disagree as to what they think the current value of the data should be? The main pitfalls are first and foremost, failing to use interrupt masking or mutexes for shared values. That's a sure invitation to race conditions and defects. But once you have interrupt masking and mutexes, you have to deal with unbounded priority inversion if you're using mutexes. And you have to consider if you don't use mutexes, whether your interrupts are masked for too long and that causes other timing scheduling problems. A related concern is that all these shared variables should be declared volatile so that when a task writes the variable back and then relinquishes control, the write actually happens and global memory gets updated before the mutex is released or before the interrupt is re-enabled. Another pitfall is assuming that non-reproducible problems aren't bugs. If you have a software failure and you can't reproduce it, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that it's hard to reproduce. And the usual suspect is going to be some sort of race condition or concurrency bug. 
The last pitfall is trying to write your own bulletproof concurrency services. These are notoriously difficult to do. That's why you should be using a real-time operating system to provide these services rather than trying to invent them on your own. The mutex operation in particular is quite tricky. There's an online set of notes that you can refer to that explains what's going on there, but you should only use that for understanding. You should use a real-time operating system implemented version rather than trying to build one yourself.